Welcome to NJ Law, the program designed to inform and educate you about the inner workings of our criminal justice system, allowing you to speak directly to New Jersey law enforcement officials who make the decisions in our two-county area. Your host, Detective Sergeant Kevin Quinn of the Township of Ocean Police Department, is an 11-year veteran police officer. He has taught at the Monmouth County Police Academy and has lectured at Monmouth College and Brookdale College. Hi, folks. Welcome to uh, NJ Law. I'm Sergeant Kevin Quinn of the Township of Ocean Police, and uh, welcome to our November show. Our next show in December is uh, going to be at 7 p.m. in the evening instead of 9, like it is now, um, and that'll be so that uh, the holiday schedule of programming can proceed correctly. How'd that sound? Good. Uh, once again, please remember that this is uh, interactive television, so uh, please write down the phone number and it'll jump on your screen every once in a while, 681-3330, call in and ask myself and my guests uh, questions having the criminal justice system. This evening, as uh, it was last time, my guests are uh, Robert A Abrams both attorneys uh, from Monmouth County. Uh, Bob, to my immediate left, who I believe is on your screen now, uh, is uh, an attorney in Ocean Township and specializes uh, in matrimoni matrimonial affairs. And uh, we're going to hear from him tonight because last time we didn't speak as much as we wanted to uh, about the matrimonial end of the law. Also, Charles Giuliano, who is to his immediate left, um, is an attorney who's been a frequent visitor here on uh, NJ Law and come down and help us out when we need to talk about some things. Uh, both of these gentlemen uh, are very learned in their particular areas that you always wanted to ask a lawyer and were afraid to ask. Now's the time to try it. Um, obviously, some currently under um, in the court system, they might not be able to discuss but they'll certainly uh, try to steer you in the right direction. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for showing up. Thanks for coming in and taking time out. I know this takes a long time, preparation and such, and I didn't read all the names on all your law firms, but... The partners <coughs> will be disappointed. <laughs> but uh, Chaz can be reached at 229-3200, uh, <laughs> and Bob yeah, can be reached at 531-6900. And uh, that should take care of that. How's that? Um, what we want to do is, is probably continue our conversation. Last time we talked about some of the different areas of the, of the courts and sometimes civil law and the criminal law kind of shakes hands, so to speak. And um, what we began near the end of last time's show, if I recall, was we were going through the court system, the different divisions. Um, Chaz, maybe I can jump to you because I think we might have left some out. I think we talked we talked a little bit about the family division. Well, I, I think you had covered the family division um, fairly well with Robert. And then we were going, I believe, geographically around the courthouse as to where the certain sections are. The law division has uh, two distinct sections, one being civil and the other being criminal. Well, obviously something that you're familiar with. The law division takes care of all litigated matters involving jury cases, plus some non-jury cases, which are called bench trials. And the criminal division takes care of only indictable offenses in Monmouth County. Um, the lesser offenses would be uh, tried in lower court, which would be your, like your Ocean Township Municipal Court. The criminal cases are jury trials 95% of the time. Uh, when a case is actually tried. There is seldom that you have a bench trial in a criminal case. There's also a chancery division, uh, which uh, is a, a, a remnant of really old English law, which is quite unique. Uh, you have uh, a chancery judge in, in Monmouth County, Judge Patrick McGann, Jr., and he sits without a jury and hears various matters involving equity. It's, a, it's an old English term. In fact, it's a very interesting history, but I don't think I should try to give a history lecture this evening on the origin of the, of the Chancery Division or Equity Court. Let us just say it's a very interesting court, and it's, uh, it's a court uh, that, uh, for instance, it's where you normally would go to get a uh, temporary restraining order. Mm -hmm. um, it's a court where you'd go for a specific 
relief, and an emergent type relief. Uh, it's a it's a court that deals with uh, uh, situations involving land. Uh, it's a very interesting court, and we can talk about it, but uh, I don't think we have enough time to this evening. Well, if we, uh, you mentioned uh, restraining orders. We're not talking about I'm not talking about violence. the domestic violence. I'm talking about a, a restraining order stopping someone from doing a particular act, mm -hmm. okay, where the court restrains you from taking this particular act. Uh, doing this particular activity. The reverse is true also with specific performance. performance right. Right, so it might even, uh, you might even seek relief to ask somebody to do something. To do something. To force them to do something if they've been uh, required to do so by contract, for example. Uh, A specific performance contract. Right. Where you're forcing someone to fulfill the conditions of that contract, you would go before Judge McGann. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think even the matrimonial court came out of the chancery court. Absolutely. The chancery court actually comes out of the religious courts of, uh, of Old England. In fact, the most famous chancellor of them all in Old England is St. Thomas More, who was chancellor for Henry VIII. Right. And that's re the real origin of that court. It was a religious court. So a lot of the, uh, I don't want to get too involved in it, but um, when we talk about old common law, or we're not talking about uh, things in the chancery or necessarily in the chancery division? Well, when you're talking about uh, old common law, you're talking about basic legal principles mm -hmm. that have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, and some of them predate statutory law. And that's, that's your chancery division. Okay. And one other thing about the chancery division, sure. there are no jury trials as exactly. far as I know. It's There's always no tried by the chancery judge. So, uh, and it's, it's a... He, he makes his own calendar. It's a, it's a very difficult court. In fact, right now, uh, uh, Judge, Judge McGann's doing an, an absolutely amazing job because Monmouth County has grown uh, proportionately, and he's the only chancery judge we have uh, in this county. And he hears all those cases. At one time, the uh, chancery judge also heard the matrimonial cases in Monmouth County. Uh, when I first clerked uh, in Monmouth County, and that was several years ago, <laughs> I clerked uh, for uh, two judges in Monmouth County. The chancery judge at that time uh, spent uh, nearly half of his time doing matrimonial and half of his time doing chancery. So we only had one half of, w of one judge doing all the matrimonial at one time in, in Monmouth County, and now we have, I guess there are five family court judges now. I guess they're running into a problem similar to what uh, Ocean County, I don't know if they still have that problem, but years, and as since I've been a police officer at one time, they had very few judges, and even though most of their prosecutors were part-time. Well, what what, what happens is the court system uh, in, in Monmouth and Ocean County has grown because of the population growth. That's what's happened. That's normal. As a matter of fact, when, when, when I first started practicing, the Chancery Judge also handled the Ocean County cases. So the chancery judge in Monmouth County would, uh, uh, covered the vicinage, it's called the vicinage, vicinage, or an area, the vicinage of Monmouth and Ocean Counties. Hmm. So you're right, there were a few judges in Ocean County. As a matter of fact, they sat in Monmouth County, a lot of them. What, uh, now we, and then we jump through the family division, which we understand covers, um, uh, takes care of a lot of the matrimonial and the domestic violence. Which, um, which, by the way, I guess later we'll talk a little bit about that because uh, there have been some changes in the domestic violence law that are taking place very soon. Um, and uh, and luckily, uh, luckily, I went to a class on it right. just the other day. That helps. So <laughs> certainly does. And I got a proof of purchase, so, <laughs> so we'll be able to talk about that. But we also want to talk uh, in a few minutes about some of the... Uh, uh, issues in matrimonial court because right. it's wide and varied, and, and I think people just don't understand what wh what they're getting into when uh, when they step into that court. But besides the chancery division, Chaz, um, and the now the law division does c cover both the civil and the criminal area, but the judges right. aren't bouncing back and forth. I mean, they're not hearing one minute a criminal case. Well, what what happens is a judge gets assigned um, in a section. A mat uh, matrimonial family law section or the criminal division, they call them divisions, criminal division or civil division for a set term. And then they, they rotate the judges. The policy that's been implemented in New Jersey by the Supreme Court is what's called a rotation system. 
where they try to have the judges uh, rotate their assignments mm -hmm. for a given period of time. So a judge may be doing uh, matrimonial for a year and then go do civil jury cases and then after another year do criminal cases for a year. Their assignments vary. Uh, and you know it's interesting uh, because I don't think we explain this to the uh, to the folks that may be tuning in, is um, uh, and especially ones from other states where they have judges that are elected and, and things like that. They don't understand. Maybe you could explain how well, the selection process for the, the selection process uh, uh, for judicial appointments in New Jersey has been uh, traditionally that a, a judge is appointed by the governor and confirmed by the state senate. Mm -hmm. The process is there's equal balance. It's not like the federal courts. Uh, the federal courts in the federal system, the president names a judge. The United States Senate confirms the judge. Normally what occurs is the president, while he's in power, will name people who are members of that president's political party. In New Jersey, because of the 1947 state constitution, what occurs is we have equal balance on our bench. So there's designated Republican seats and designated Democratic seats. So that the governor, like Governor Florio, for instance, it re appoints Republicans to the bench. And the, uh, the process is that the names are submitted to the governor's office. And normally that's done by the, the local political um, county organization, like in Monmouth County, would be uh, the Republican and Democratic organizations. And either chairman in, in Monmouth County would be either Victor Scuderi or William Dowd, uh, would, after consultation, um, give a set of names to the governor's office for people that they believe should be considered uh, for a judgeship. And then these people would be screened and have to go before certain bar association committees. Mm -hmm and then the governor's office would also review it. And then there's something which I think you're familiar with, which is called a four-way check, which is done by the state police. And then after the four-way check is done and, and the governor's uh, office is satisfied that this person they believe would make a decent, a good judge, uh, the, the name is uh, submitted uh, to the state senate and that person appears in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And uh, if that person meets muster, uh, is confirmed should be noted also the State Bar Association takes a very active role in the selection of a judge. Uh, there is a compact between the State Bar Association and the governor's office where a potential nominee uh, has to appear in front of that State Bar Association committee. It's a committee consisting of approximately, it's over 20 members. One delegate from each county plus I believe a couple of officers of the State Bar Association or a chairman or vice chairman of that committee. So maybe there's 23. And they would interview the candidates, uh, and then they would give a recommendation to the governor. So it's, it's a long, arduous pr uh, process. And in fact, it takes, uh, you have to be an attorney at least 10 years in this state in order to be a superior court judge, not a municipal court judge. That's different, because they're appointed by the local uh, municipalities, whatever the governing body is, either mayor form or committee or council form. Uh, that's the process. Whereas a place like New York, uh, the judges are elected, which is entirely different. And here, uh, although it's a somewhat political process, I think we've done amazingly well for ourselves. I, I think we have. Uh, uh, I think yeah. it's a better process than an elected process. And it should be noted that a judge receives a set term. And after the expiration of the term, uh, seven years seven now, years. it used to be five, it's seven years now. After seven years, they are then again reviewed and uh, reevaluated. And if the governor so chooses, they'll renominate that person. And uh, if the Senate confirms, the person then receives tenure for life. So it's seven years plus one day um, in order to receive a, a lifetime tenure to the bench. I'm sure the audience uh, recalls a recent hearing that uh, a judge was just appointed Clarence Thomas. In the federal courts, that was obviously and a... It's a lifetime appointment. A, federal, uh, right. federal appointment's a lifetime appointment from the date of the appointment. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing that um, should be noted uh, is that during that, that term that a judge serves, there's constant evaluation. Uh, we have a system 
in, in New Jersey where they have uh, judicial review committees uh, uh, done by the, uh, by the administrative office of the courts. Like, for instance, I can appear in front of a judge and I'll receive afterwards uh, a, uh, a form, a form an evaluation form, exactly, like a report card. And you appeared in front of Judge X, would you tell us what the judge's demeanor was, et cetera, right. and uh, have a checklist, and you send it in. So it, there's constant scrutiny on these, on these judges. It's not an easy job mm. at all. I agree. It is not an easy job. Uh, and uh, are the, well, you know, <laughs> Is, and, and are people chomping at the bit for this job? I mean, oh, it, there are, there are, sure. a lot of lawyers would love to become a judge because it has a tremendous amount of status. Sure. Uh, it, uh, for many lawyers, this is the pinnacle of their career. And it's a wonderful thing to be a judge, especially if you enjoy that. Uh, um, if you enjoy the practice, uh, the, the practice of law, and the, the scholarly part of the practice of law and making decisions and enjoy working with people and, and uh, deciding difficult problems. It, it's, it's a great job. Both Bob and I had the benefit of being judicial clerks. Um, so we, at a very young age, were exposed to the court system working with a judge. Correct. And uh, I think that that is the best experience any young law graduate could have. All right, uh, Chaz, I agree with you completely. I, I had a better experience uh, clerking in Monmouth County than I think, uh, and I think I learned more than the three years that I had in law school. Uh, I've always said Do that. Do you agree that? Uh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I, I can say this, I guess even I guess publicly here, that, that I think I really learned to write well while I was clerking. I literally imitated the style of writing of Judge Simmel. He never knew that, but I started imitating his style of writing, and we ended up publishing two opinions while he was a uh, trial-level judge, which is very, very unusual. Uh, and to this day, I write the same way. I, I changed my entire style of writing. I found out that he was dictating memoranda far better than I was writing them. And I couldn't understand what he was doing and why he was doing this. And I found out that he would write in short declarative sentences, very similar to the style of writing of John F. Kennedy. It was his style of writing. Judge uh, Simmel was not exactly a uh, political compatriot of, uh, no, not of at all. Uh, John Kennedy, but they were totally in opposite it's sides. Nice. But they <laughs> both had great talent. and. Uh, and they both wrote very well. well. Judge Simmel had had a political background. I think he'd been sp speaker at the Jersey Assembly at one time in the yeah. 50s. Judge Simmel had a very unusual situation. He may have been the only person in the history of New Jersey who at one time was in the judiciary, or at least connected to the judiciary, in the administration and in the legislature. He was a speaker of the Assembly, and at that time, and I don't know if it continues today, but the speaker of the Assembly becomes acting governor when the governor is out of state, or at least he did at that time. And he was acting governor, he was speaker of the assembly, and had already been appointed as, as a judge. Of course, had not started, been sworn in yet. Been yeah. sworn in. So he may have been the only person in the history of New Jersey who'd been connected to all three branches of government. In such a cl uh, close period of time. Right, 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 right. Well, I always thought that it, it seems that uh, municipal court judges, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, seem to get a. Uh, kind of a wide range of experiences just hearing. It seems like they hear a little bit of everything, even more so I than... I think that a municipal court judgeship is probably one of the best preparations for an upper court judgeship you can have, because a municipal court judge in most municipalities, when they're sitting, have to make so many decisions in such a short period of time, it's amazing. Oh. The volume that they handle. Mm -hmm. Uh, and cases varied, and very varied, varied too. absolutely it, varied. Every, it Motor jumps vehicle. all over the place. All of a sudden, they're looking at something that's that's uh, may not even belong in their court. Well, exactly. We we discussed day. it last week. Sometimes they have cases that really, uh, although a criminal complaint's been signed, has uh, civil litigation written all over it. Uh, they're handling motor vehicle cases. They're handling uh, quasi criminal cases with the Dis Disorderly Persons Act. Uh, criminal judges uh, real uh, strike that I should say municipal court judges really get 
a varied experience. And they they really don't, don't have a heck of a lot of time to prepare for each case. And, 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 they, so and they don't many... have the benefit of a law clerk, either. right? Yeah, it's not like they can. Do, <laughs> right. They're not taking a whole a whole lot of breaks so that they can go in and, <laughs> and see what the books is. You know, there's, there's a thing about municipal court judges also that's very similar to matrimonial law, in the sense that the people that come before municipal judges very often come there for the first, first time. time. That is their first experience with the justice system, criminal or otherwise, as, as it is, as I said last two weeks ago, about matrimonial law. Frequently, the first experience that an individual has with the justice system is a divorce or something in the nature of a divorce, separation or whatever. So uh, that's the same thing with a municipal that's court true. judge, and it's a very sensitive job. It's a very sensitive post, and it's very important for a municipal court judge to have the proper demeanor, because they, they are uh, involving themselves with uh, people who are new in the justice system. It's very true. I agree. Yeah, and I've, and I've seen a lot of municipal court judges uh, um, on the bench, and, and some of the better ones I have seen uh, go on further. Uh, Judge Kreisman from our right. court uh, was excellent. and. Uh, uh, and a lot of times he'd have to almost play defense attorney and prosecutor at the same time, uh, you know, sure. to help somebody through their uh, their courtroom experience. I think I think that probably does uh, aid them a lot in preparing them for what's uh, what's further down the line. Um, I just wanted to pause just a second to remind the folks at home that uh, we're here at uh, six eight one three 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 zero. You can give us a call on the phone. Uh, the number will appear on your screen from time to time. Uh, I don't know if it is now. My monitor uh, went out. But um, if, uh, if you'd care to call us and ask us any of the questions about the subjects we're discussing, uh, give us a call. Or if you have an idea for a subject you'd like to be uh, or would like to see discussed here on uh, NJ Law. Oh, we're back. There we are. Um, we, uh, we would certainly be glad to uh, do that for you. Um, I just want to take a break uh, and let these guys catch their breath for a second. Um, and Bob, uh, get ready for matrimonial um, heaven, so to speak. <laughs> uh, the, the other day I went to a, a seminar uh, given by the prosecutor's office on uh, the new, the new uh, guidelines for the domestic violence cases. And um, I think uh, we owe it to you in the form of our uh, education um, here about the criminal justice system to explain just a little bit about this to you. And um, what happens is when, when a law is passed, obviously, uh, we just don't get a copy of it. Uh, the prosecutor in Monmouth County has usually been real good about setting somebody down to, uh, to explain it to us. So Ken Keller from the Family Division came down the other day and, uh, and explained uh, this new law to us. Uh, and what happens in Monmouth County if you're not, if you um, are locked up in your closet and never read the newspaper, uh, you wouldn't know that John Kay takes an active part in just about everything that goes on in this county, uh, especially when it comes to law enforcement. And what usually happens is we'll get the law and then he'll set down guidelines, uh, oftentimes that are even more strict than the, uh, than the law is. So some of the things that uh, the new um, domestic violence law has, we've actually been doing here in Monmouth County for a while. Um, because of the strict guidelines on the last uh, regular um, Domestic Violence Act. But a few of the things that, that have happened is they've added a few statutes to uh, what can be defined as domestic violence, including homicide, um, which uh, apparently may have been put in there for statistical purposes mostly because uh, restraining orders wouldn't be of a lot, and uh, criminal trespass. And they've also changed the definition of someone who can be protected by this act to anyone 18 years of older, which is the way it was, um, who's an emancipated minor, which is the same as it was. Uh, and if we need a definition on that, give us a call and we'll be glad to tell you. Um, and that uh, it also has to do with any person who has lived in a household that's over 18. So that could be p persons of the same sex, uh, whereas before it was uh, uh, always defined as uh, domestic violence if the persons were of opposite sex. It also requires the police, that's us, to, uh, to take certain actions and that's if we see any signs of domestic violence um, and it's present when we go no matter what anybody says 
uh, the person who we can determine by uh, our best guesstimate or better yet probable cause to believe committed that uh, we're required to take them into custody. Um, so if if we go somewhere and, and either party, uh, whoever seems to be the victim, says, well, it's okay, we want to forget about the whole thing, it can't happen like that, we're required by law to take action. And that's uh, for obvious reasons, for the protection of the victim and on the other persons who might be present. We're also uh, required to take into possession any weapons we find in the house, which obviously makes sense. Um, the uh, we can take in the, uh, into, um, while we're trying to make up our mind as to what's going on, because very often uh, if you folks watch TV, if you watch some of the cop shows, you know that domestics are probably one of the most dangerous and volatile situations we ever get into. Um, once we get there, if we're having a problem discovering who the victim is, we can take into account maybe a past history, if there's been other types of uh, domestic violence at that uh, location and who was the uh, perpetrator or the actor, as the law calls it, um, in the past. Um, and if the, obviously, if the victim ex uh, exhibits any signs of injury. Um, the other thing is that there's a domestic violence relief or domestic violence restraining order, which can be issued by the court in an emergent situation. And um, Part, there's two parts to that now, and, it, and it's a lot more complicated of a form, but um, we've been instructed, and, and I'm sure all the police departments in Monmouth County will comply, that uh, we help the victim with making out this form as much as possible. And there's going to be two parts of that form, and one's going to be have to do with the actual restraints. That means not returning to the scene. Um, and also uh, any other types of restraints having to do with weapons and such. And then a second part, which will have to do with um, either child support or alimony payments, which the judge can also order on an emergent basis. Uh, and there will be two types of contempt for that. Uh, and not to confuse you, but one of them uh, it will, it will require immediate incarceration, and the second type will be civil remedies, which will be handled more along the lines of a matrimonial. Uh, type situation, um, which I think Bob will allude to a little bit when we talk about um, some of the matrimonial. Hopefully I haven't confused you. I don't see all the phone lines lit, so, uh, <laughs> and these guys aren't looking at me too bad. But that's kind of in a nutshell, that's it. Um, if people uh, who happen to reside together or have resided together in the past um, are having a problem, uh, of this nature and the police are called to that scene, uh, we're going to take action. And it's obvious that we want to be able to protect uh, both parties involved in this situation and, and obviously the victim. And uh, the police are just going to, uh, this law will allow us to take a more active part in that and, um, and use some of our discretion uh, along with some areas where we won't really have any discretion. So if you have any questions, please give us a call. If you don't, and you think of something tomorrow, um, even if you uh, have a particular question, if you can't get it answered by your local PD or if you're not represented by an attorney, call the family division in Freehold and they'll be glad to help you out. They're, uh, they're listed right in the phone book. Okay, good. Um, Bob, I'm going to throw it to you for a second. Uh, what, I, what I guess what we need to talk about a little bit is matrimonial is confusing everybody and there's not anybody who who understands this as well as you do, and maybe you could give us an idea of all the different ramifications and, and, and what happens, and we talk about child support, and apparently there's a couple of different kinds, and so I'm confused, so unconfuse us, sure. please. <laughs> I'll try to go over the, the, uh, the various issues and try to answer some of the questions that uh, a lot of people have when I conduct an interview I usually go over these issues to try to explain as, as best as I can what those issues are and how they're generally resolved. Uh, so if I, I made some notes so I won't forget the issues and forgive me, I'll put on my glasses just for a second. Um, all right. The first, the first issue uh, in any matrimonial case, if there are children, is really the issue of custody. 
custody obviously involves uh, the uh,